As I alluded to before, occasionally there are patients who don't take medicines in the way you prescribe them. Of course, this doesn't happen to my patients. It's always someone else's patients. But that being said, we're often very poor judges of who is actually taking their medications. Even when you put people in clinical trials, so this is a schizophrenia patient who knows that he or she is in a study, and often they do these studies with what's called a MEMS cap. MEMS cap is a cap which has an electronic chip embedded in it. Every time the person opens the pill bottle, it registers the date and the time. It's a good proxy for adherence. The assumption is if they're going to the trouble of opening the pill bottle, maybe they'll actually be taking their pill. Even when you have people in a study and you say, we're going to consider you adherent if you take your medicines five days out of seven, which is about 70%. The actual level of adherence was about 43%, meaning 57% of people were non-adherent, even though they were in a study and even though they were being watched. But of course, if you ask the patient, well, what proportion of you are are actually taking your medicines five days out of seven? 95% said they were adherent. And if you ask the psychiatrist, their estimate of adherence was 93%. And so we often have no idea what actually is going on with the patient. We often assume that the person is taking their medication simply because they show up to their appointments and they refill their prescriptions. And the fact that they remain stable just has to do with biological features of their illness. With whatever level of adherence or whatever level of drug exposure they are experiencing, it keeps them together. The other important concept is that a lot of times people are deemed treatment resistant. Like, wow, I prescribed this guy 40 milligrams of olanzapine and he refills his prescriptions and I'm pretty sure he's taking them because all my patients are adherent. Well, guess what? We have great data here from McCutcheon out of uh, the UK, which looked at a group of 99 outpatients who were thought to be treatment resistant by their clinicians. And surprise, surprise, more than a third had subtherapeutic plasma levels, and a good chunk of those actually had undetectable plasma levels whatsoever. So you say, okay, that's fine. I'd like to maybe see what's going on with my patient. How do I have some gross sense of whether they're taking their medication? Well, the way to have an understanding of this for people on oral medications is to at least to have some numbers which correlate an oral dose with a plasma level. Now, the assumption in this table that I'm showing you for all these drugs is that the person is an extensive metabolizer, that they're not on inducers, with the one section of clozapine where I show the effect of smoking. So, for example, you have somebody on 20 milligrams at bedtime of aripiprazole. Typically, we get these as 12-hour troughs, and you order it. So, what result would you expect? Well, I would expect something in the middle range of 200 nanogram per ml. And so, Here we see a mean level of around 230 with a large standard deviation. Again, you have to account for variations there. But certainly, if somebody was on 20 milligrams a day of aripiprazole and their level was 20, you know they are not taking their medication. For clozapine, we have to take into account the impact of smoking. So I give you some basic information depending upon whether the person is a smoker or not and whether they are male or female. For haloperidol, a good relationship to remember is that 10 milligrams per day, again, given at bedtime, so 10 milligrams QHS, should generate a trough plasma level of around 7.8 nanograms per ml. We have a few other ones as well here. For fulfenazine, the data are kind of spotty, and this is the best I could come up with. For lanzapine, the data are much more solid. You can see for a non-smoker, your plasma level is about two times your oral dose. So if you had somebody on 10 milligrams QHS, you would expect a trough plasma level of 20. On the other hand, if they are a smoker, you can see the relationship is diminished somewhat. And, you know, we have a lot of medicines, regardless of adherence and all that, which just have multiple possibilities for kinetic issues, and lorazodone is one of them. So lorazodone, as many of you know, goes through P450, 3A4. And so there's a number of drugs which both inhibit and induce this. You can see it actually has a significant interaction with strong 3A4 inhibitors, which increase the area under the curve ninefold. And you cannot use it with strong inhibitors. You can use it with moderate inhibitors, where it increases it only twofold. Conversely, strong inducers reduce the plasma levels by 80%, and you're just wasting your time if you try to combine lorazodone with, let's say, carbamazepine or phenytoin. There's also a food effect as well. 
And so given all these complexities, and there's also some variations in P453A4 genetics, the conclusion from the imaging studies is that D2 occupancy correlates very poorly with lorazodone dose, but very well with the plasma level of the active moiety. And here's a nice graph from Steve Pockin to illustrate this. So here's just a couple of comments about getting plasma levels. In general, the rule is give the bulk of your antipsychotic at bedtime, ideally all of it if possible, and get your levels as a 12-hour trough after the bedtime dose in the morning and before they take any morning medication. Even among adherent patients, you may often see levels fluctuating up to 30%. Changes beyond this probably, especially if you see this repeatedly where they bounce around quite a bit, are probably due to non-adherence or maybe some new kinetic issue. But assuming that they haven't changed their other medications or habits, almost certainly it's due to non-adherence. So if you see levels bouncing around by 50% or more, probably there's an adherence issue, again, assuming that they're getting the levels obtained at the same time in the morning. Of course, you should always be mindful that there are ultra-rapid metabolizers or people who are inducing, let's say, 1A2 by smoking and, and be mindful of that. And again, a lot of people are just non-adherent. And so you just have to understand that this is the nature of the game when you're treating people with chronic severe mental illness. The other point I want to make here, which I'll mention, is that laboratory reference ranges are idiosyncratic at best. And so simply because your lab might say 20 nanogram per ml is the highest haloperidol level you're supposed to prescribe, this is not borne out by the literature. As I say, we've published data on people who tolerate levels up to 30, and there's people who tolerate even higher levels. So the best way to use laboratory ranges for antipsychotics is to look at the lowest number, meaning the threshold for response. That is probably pretty good data. The upper numbers are usually based on just some idiosyncratic reading of the literature. And the most important concept is, let's say the lab says the upper limit of clozapine is 700, but your patient's been on a stable dose for years and their plasma level is 850. Do not reflexively reduce doses simply because the patient's plasma level exceeds the laboratory range. Antipsychotics have a much broader safety margin than do drugs like lithium or anticonvulsants. Often we will get consultations in the state hospital for patients who they say, hey, this person is stable, but their clozapine level is 1,000. What should I do? The most important thing is to document that the patient is tolerating this particular level and then recheck it. Occasionally there are lab errors, but if it comes back 1,000 again on a repeated basis, you can say, all right, this is what this person needs to be stable and they're showing no adverse effects. But rapid reduction of doses is most likely going to destabilize your patient, and more likely than not, the patient may need that level for a response. Now, if the level is excessively high, you get a plasma haloperidol level of 54. Generally, what we tell people is they may not need a level much beyond 30, but do not cut their dose in half. There is a concept of what's called supersensitivity psychosis, that people exposed to very high levels of D2 blockade don't look so good when you take away a lot of that D2 blockade very quickly. So often in those patients, we will say very slowly reduce the haloperidol by no more than perhaps 5% per month. The idea is you don't want to unmask their psychosis in the way you might unmask tardive dyskinesia if you take away an antipsychotic too quickly. So the key points, once again, plasma level is the best proxy for antipsychotic CNS action. Getting levels during periods of stability can often help detect non-adherence, and for non-responders, levels can be helpful for three reasons. To see if you've reached the point of futility, to see if there are kinetic or adherence issues leading to subtherapeutic levels, and most importantly, to tell you whether you have room for further dose increases.